Smile, we do make mistakes. We do misspeak. We do, we don't know some protocols. And so there's a level of forgiveness here that we're all learning together. Fully embrace all of our individuality and our collective past, present, and future card. Thank you for that. We're holding some legacies in the Great Lakes Basin that are unsavory, um, particularly in relations to indigenous communities and to how we have commodified life. So we're holding that. We're living uh, an embodiment of the, com of the commons, and we're going forward underneath a shared, hopefully, vision and uh, multifaceted work. Listen, but open to fresh air. Somebody said we need to breathe. So if you want to go outside and just take in Notre Dame's campus or sit and observe a tree, please do that. Um, listening generously, we are trying to be attentive listeners, really trying to hear and feel people, what are they saying, what are they communicating. So Lila brought that up, to ge listen generously. And accountability and follow through um, from the young woman from Sylvia. Sylvia. Sylvia says that if you get someone your business card, follow through. <laughs> don't show up in places talking about it. I'm going to call you when you don't call. Call me. Call me. And if you need to learn about all of the aspects of the water, that Nicole brought up the ideal that we have to be present and attend to the cohabitation of the waters. So it's not only us, it's the trees, it's other life forms, it's butterflies, it's the critters of the land. Um, and how are we attending to them? And honoring knowledge from many sources, we're honoring the lived experience, other ways of knowing, the left brain, the right brain, the heart, and the spirit. That knowledge that sometimes comes intuitively that can't be verified by surveys or Academia, so we're honoring all of that. Academia and all forms of knowledge. And <coughs> open-minded, we're asking people to be open. You have an open mind. And definitely um, moving towards a new narrative. <coughs> we're requesting that we are blending and weaving a narrative and that it's going to be a wonderful tapestry of many voices. And all voices are relevant. And lastly, to create ripples in our communities that we are a piece of a 35 million human community and an even broader ecological community. And that these ripples in our gatherings is going to touch the 35 million and it's also going to touch our cohabitation of life in the basin. So thank you for these agreements. Mm -hmm. So we're going to move into our morning. Are you ready? Okay. No, that's okay. I'll <laughs> 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 So, if everyone um, can turn your chairs this way, just swivel. We're going to have a presentation. <laughs> A new paradigm for the future of our waters, given by Ron Clay. He needs no introduction. He's going to introduce himself. And thank you, Ron. What a great introduction. Um, my name is Ron Clay, and I'm from Anjanong First Nation. Uh, and it's uh, sounded pretty much just like we spelled out there. It's Anjanong. Uh, we are in southwestern Ontario, just across from Detroit, about an hour up on the Canadian side. Um, I'm going to just uh, show you some slides while I tell you a story and ask you some questions, and then I'm going to introduce a couple of really good friends. <laughs>
There's 63 petrochemical refineries that surround my community. We are the most polluted spot in North America, as called by National Geographic. We have the most contaminated air shed in Canada, according to the World Health Organization. If it becomes a contest, we win. We're worse than the tar sands. We're worse than anything you've seen or visited in Mexico. We are worse than Louisiana, Texas, California, and even New Jersey. We win. Does everybody know what this is? Yes. Y'all seen this? There's two stories to the dream patch. Do y'all know the stories? No. Well, there's the first story that you've heard about where the dreams, uh, um, they pull around the other side of this. And I'm just going to grab a little. So the dreams, they go around the other side of that. This is what the fable tells us anyway. They go around the other side, and then they go through the intertwining inter 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 of the webbing. And the good dreams grip off the feathers, and they fall on your head, and you have good dreams all night. And in the center there is where all the bad dreams come out. That's the fable. In reality, the dream catcher was made to hang on the teeth knot. It resembled the spider's web. It kept the spider, it kept the bugs away from the baby. The beads and knickknacks were put there to entertain the baby. But you don't sell too many good dream catches with that story. <laughs> so we'll stick with the true story. <laughs> this is Angelo. It was really funny when this picture was taken, one of the chiefs said, uh, he sent me an email and he said, what does our chief now think he's the Pope and he's in, so the smoke is coming up the top? This is an incident from a plant can't see directly behind our, our band outs. That's how close we are. Canada is so proud of us. I'm going to flip through some slides, but I'm going to continue on the dream catcher thing just for a second here because what I wanted to do was, was give you an understanding of our dream catcher in Angela. See, our dream catcher, if you remember the image, well, these things flash by you here. Um, the petrochemical industry has their dreams, and their dreams of unaccountability, of lack of transparency, of the ability to do with our environment that they will, flows around the other ring of that dream catcher, and it flows right down through the feathers, and it drips on their heads in the names of profits. Mm. Inside of that webbing, if you try to imagine the webbing to be pipes, all of those pipes that span out from Angenon across North America, and quite literally, we're connected to South Central Los Angeles, we're connected to the tar sands, we're connected to the boreal forest, we're connected to everything. There's over a thousand pipes that run underneath my community right now today. And through those pipes run the chemicals and run the, the oil and the bitumen that generates all of those profits for those people. In the center, if you remember the black hole where the, uh, um, the, the bad dreams go, that's my home. We are the black spot in the middle of the dream catcher. Inside that black spot, there was a lady named Ada Lockridge and myself, and we began to yell. And like the Who's down in Whoville, we yelped from the black spot as hard as we could yell, and nobody came to us. We contacted the Assembly of First Nations, and we were told that they were a policy-driven organization, and there wasn't much that they could do. And I don't want to slight the workers. That's what they're told, and that's what they have to do, and they don't have the resources. So we continued to yell from that black spot until somebody heard us. And the very first people to hear us was a gentleman named Jim Brophy, Dr. Jim Brophy. He ran the Occupational Health Clinic for Ontario Workers. And he came to the edge of that hole, only he didn't have the strength and he didn't have the capacity to help us. What he did have was a network. So through Jim came his wife, Marty, and then came Dr. Uh, uh, Warren Teal, and uh, Michael Gilbertson and on and on and on. All of these people started to gather around that hole and hear us yell from inside the dream catcher about the contamination. We're the first human population on the planet 
to have documented endocrine disruption. We have more girls born than boys. And it's a direct relation to what they're pumping into our water, what we're drinking, what they're putting into the air, and what we're breathing. So through that dream catcher, through that hole, and through the yelping, we began to get some notice. We began to have arms reach down into that hole and try to pull Ada and I up. And I'll tell you, as honestly as I can tell anybody, we received no support from our chief and counsel. I don't want to say that there was anything nefarious going on. I don't want to say that you, in, in a bad light to our chief and counsel, but when for a hundred years you've been hearing the propaganda of <coughs> industry and government, you begin to believe that propaganda. They've got our best interests at heart. If things were that bad, the government would do something about it. But we chuckle because we're of all the same mind. John and Jane Q. Canadian and American believe that to be wholeheartedly true. So something very strange happened. Michael Gilbertson asked a really weird question. Hey, it's got lots of girls. And we began to think. We had two girls being born for every boy. When that study got published in Environmental Health Perspectives, the world knocked on my door. Researchers from around the world came because it had never been documented before in humans. And along with researchers came documentaries. We had 11 documentaries done on what's going on in Armstrong. I've appeared in everything from National Geographic to Men's Health, because I'm the picture of health. <laughs> Talking about the sex ratios in my community, about the birth ratios in my community. We aren't in good shape. Now, in the years since all of this began, um, nothing has changed. We have been everywhere. I have spoken on this throughout Europe, Canada, Mexico, the United States. Nothing has changed. I got to be a little well known. I got my 15 minutes of fame that Andy Warhol promised me. I got invited to teach at Trent University in Indigenous Environmental Studies. I got to speak to the British Parliament. I got asked by Prime Minister Stephen Harper to stop calling him Crime Minister Stephen Harper because I gave him that. I was able to do some things that just are unbelievable to even myself. I refer to it as the creator has tapped me. Every once in a while when I'm ready to quit, when I'm overwhelmed, when people are dying around me like I cannot express, mm -hmm. I get tapped. We were in a, a beautiful, most pristine place I've ever been with an organization called the Sustainability Network. And a gentleman from Nexon was talking to us, and that's a company up in the tar sands. And he was a native guy, and he looked at us, and he said, you know, you make up less than 3% of the Canadian population. 97% of the Canadian population doesn't care what's happening to you. There's a room full of Indians that are just about ready to rip this man's head off. Kudos for honesty, but buddy, you're an ass. So we had to get out of there because this man is not in good shape. So we went. We went for a walk. Kathleen was there. We happened to cross an eagle's nest, and underneath that eagle's nest was feathers everywhere. I get goosebumps. This is the creator going, settle down, guys. You're doing what's right. We walked around everywhere, branches on the ground, feathers everywhere. We were tapped. <clears throat> we went up to the tar sands. I was invited up to Fort Chit to do a talk up in Fort Chit because we have a very uh, 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 similar situation in that we, we lose too many people of our communities to uh, uh, cancers caused by petroleum pollution. And I was there with Tom Goldtooth and Clayton Thomas and Heather Milton Lightning and some of you know who these guys are. The community gave us a house. I said, stay in this house as long as you need it. 
And we were sitting in there having a conversation, much like Charity and Robert and I were having this morning, uh, and Robert's wife about how do we communicate the outcome of this to the, to the world? And we were talking about the tar sands. It was very early in the campaign. Most of the world hadn't heard of tar sands yet. And this fisherman came in and he dropped on the table a fish with two jaws. Sticking out of the bottom was a second jaw. And that jaw had eye teeth. Fish don't have eye teeth, ladies and gentlemen. Creative tactics. You need a PR campaign? Here's the tool. I tell you all of this for uh, this reason. I couldn't tell you when I met Josephine. I don't know how long it's been. I refer to her as my grandma. I don't say I love a whole lot of people in this planet. That is one woman I would tell you I love. We uh, don't see each other near enough. But I was tapped with her friendship and her love. I was tapped with the friendship and love of Ada Lockridge because when everything else is ending, when I'm ready to quit, she phones me, she texts me, she emails me. It's almost like she's psychically connected to me. And she just me. I was tapped with the friendship of Sue Chiblo and Kathleen Padula. We know everything about each other's families, about our lives. We've gone from being strangers to friends to family. I was tapped. My cousin is here, and, and I, you know, we have a bond. And unfortunately, we don't get to exercise that bond because we never see each other. We laugh because we bump into each other at places like this. This is how we have to see each other. I'm very blessed in the support that I have what I do because what I do is a horrible job. What we do is a horrible job. We sit across the table from people who try to justify this. That's on the right? And they tell us there is no off-site impact in every press release about this incident. No off-site impact. Can you see why I want to quit? I want to bury my head in the sand? I can't. I see mine. She's never home. She sacrifices absolutely everything about her personal life for this. For my children and her children and our grandchildren. I can't quit. I'm not allowed to quit. We are all tapped by the Creator, ladies and gentlemen, because we are here. And there are people in this room that I love. And there's people in this room that I'm meeting for the first time, that we are meeting for the first time. And come the end of the day tomorrow, I know you are going to impact me. I know I'm going to walk away with that business card. And yes, somebody I will call. <laughs> I thank you for my little bit of 15 minutes up here. Um, I, I can't at all uh, do justice to Josephine. Mark. I can't explain what they've done. You all know what they've done. I can look out into the room and I can say to the youth that made the trip up here, um, you're meeting the superstars. You're meeting the, the Wayne Gretzky's and the Mario Lemieux's, or I don't know the U.S. equivalent to this. <laughs> you're meeting them. You're going to listen to them. You're going to learn from them. There's so much knowledge in this in this room. I thank you for your time. And, uh, I might just call you. Please, we'll borrow. Josephine. Mm -hmm.